everybody, it's Tyler here at Championships checking in with our number one ranked team, the FRC Top 25, incredible Hall of Fame team, 254 Cheesy Poofs. You gotta love this robot and everything this team brings, both from an impact side and also uh, from their incredible robot side as well too. Of course, we'll be going through a full journey. There's so much to dive into. You're gonna get a look at a little bit more on the inside of this robot, and what it has to bring. Talking, of course, all the mechanical features as well. Some great stuff and programming and what they're doing too. Uh, but you gotta love this uh, overall turret with the spin dexter that they're using as well. I can't wait to dive more in this robot. So let's learn more about the proofs this year here on Behind the Bumpers. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineer their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to kettering.edu slash first to learn more and apply. Support funds content creators when you sign up for a membership on YouTube Join. You'll get access to special perks like emotes, loyalty badges, and fund members will even get early access to our scheduled videos and more. 100% of this revenue will go back to our correspondents to help recognize their efforts. Click the join button in any YouTube video to pledge your support. Ivy, let's do a full rundown of this robot here, starting out with your drive base as we kind of work up through that note journey as well. There's so much to break down. What do you want to start out with? Uh, yeah, so let's start with our drive base. It's the basis of any robot that we build, and it's one of the most ro robust subsystems that we try to build every single year. So this year we went with a swerve drive again, um, but there's some differences that we made um, along the way. We made some changes along uh, the season. So one main difference from last year is that these frame rails are actually three by ones as opposed to two by ones. Um, we generally go by with two by ones, but three by ones this year just so that we can lower our CG even more sure. and also so that we don't even run over any notes and get them clogged in our swerve modules. Um, some other things to note, uh, we're using Krakens on every single part of this robot. We're not using Falcons th uh, this year. And then um, another thing is that we actually modified our swerve modules a little bit. So one thing is that we added these swerve module covers to each one of them, and we'll uh, talk about it a bit more, but they're uh, used to mount our pizza box or feeder box, and then that's how we feed into our shooter. Um, but in addition to that, we also took the normal L3 Mark IV eyes and then actually swapped out the drive pinion for uh, 13 tooth. Uh, just so that we're it's gearing it down a little bit, but then it also reduces our current draw and then it didn't doesn't have a great uh, Very big impact overall on like our speed and getting to notes and like zooming around the field um, Yeah, and then it's a little hard to kind of see right now But then all of our electronics are mounted on the drive base um, as usual But then one big constraint that we had this year was actually our bigus Which is a big part of our turret and how we wanted to mount our electronics and how we wanted to just make sure that we didn't oh, like run into our turret or our bigus or anything like that. Can we take a look kind of the inside of that a little bit? Yeah, uh, so one of the ways that we can do that is by taking off the back part of the pizza box. This is how we get to our battery. Um, but then you can see some of the electronics, some of the wire management and things like that. Something I want to ask you on your uh, drive frame as well too, you're having an open field game like it is right now. Uh, what considerations does your team have in regards to like uh, robot damage, clotting other robots, things like that? Yeah, so uh, compared from last year, we definitely had a lot of robot damage with frame rails bending, things like that. So this robot is, I'd say, a lot more robust in terms of taking impacts and things like that. And you'll see that as we uh, go through for some of the precautions that we uh, took. For this year, we actually went with all 8th inch for, uh, for, uh, tube, sorry, uh, eighth inch tube uh, frame rails sure. as opposed to 16th uh, from before. And then we also took some other additional measures for our under the bumper intake um, just so that it doesn't take any impacts and that we're making sure making sure that it's as sturdy as possible. Well, run me through this uh, under the bumper intake as we kind of keep following that note uh, into other aspects. Yeah, so this was probably one of the subsystems that we uh, iterated the most on just because of how tightly integrated it is with the rest of the robot in terms of the shooter, uh, the carriage, the uh, amplifier and things like that. Um, but this consists of a series of four rollers um, we have one roller here, we have a kick-up roller, um, we have another roller back here, and our three-inch redirect roller. Um, so we're using cat tongue tape on most of the rollers because we found that that actually works really well and yeah. just helps the note kind of glide in. And then one thing that's kind of interesting is down here to help with vectoring the notes into our into the middle of our intake, we're using mechanome wheels, uh, in addition to these passive 3D printed rollers that are just on the sides. Um, yeah. And then one other interesting thing about the intake is that it also works as an exhaust into our amplifier system, uh, which we'll talk about a bit more, but that's done via this uh, one-way ramp over here that's held in by springs. So as you can see, when the note comes in from the bottom, you're gonna hear this spring go, uh, you're gonna hear this ramp go up, and then that's what the redirect roller then pushes it into the pizza box and the spindexer. But then when it has to go back up, this is completely sturdy, and then when we have to exhaust, we'll exhaust straight up into our amplifier. 
Very cool. Um, a couple other things I want to talk about uh, for you as well, too. Um, as I know we'll be talking about more about how that spin dexter process works. Anything in particular with your shooter that you wanted to cover or the turret itself? Yeah, uh, so for our shooter, I'd say that it's um, it's definitely gone through a lot of iterations. Um, at Sacramento, we for between Sacramento and East Bay, we actually redesigned our entire uh, shooter pretty much because we had a lot of problems with it. We, were, we weren't happy with the spin-up time. So one thing that we did is we actually added a whole new motor. We added more rollers. We made the uh, trajectory more straight so that we just get more co uh, consistent and flat shots. And then one thing that's a uh, little different that you might see is that we actually added these inertia flywheels to the ends of each of our shooters, uh, to the e ends of each of the shafts. And that's mainly just because of the testing that we did. We tested a lot of different wheel configurations with different materials, and we found that we needed a lot, uh, a lot of moment of inertia in the back with uh, really heavy fair lanes. But one thing is that that actually led to our robot being really overweight. Sure. Um, so then one thing that we did is we machined these flywheels and then just added them so that we'd keep that moment of inertia while still remaining really lightweight. And we found that it's having great results when we have to shoot really consistently or just a lot of distance in a row. And we'll get back to your turret in just a moment as well too, but how about your climbing mechanism? Rock, walk me through what you're running for that. Yeah, so our climbing me mechanism is just a series of box tubing and, uh, and hooks on a winch system. Um, so there's a jack shaft that drives both sides equally. And then one thing that you'll actually see is that the climbing mechanism is integrated with the intake in terms of its gearbox. You can see that the climbing mechanism gearbox is actually uh, down here and there's a jack shaft that drives it across the robot. And one thing that we'll get into more is that our turret mounting actually had to have provisions for that. So there's a big hole that allows our jack shaft to run through our turret, um, uh, our turret tubing. And then that's kind of how we just help support our climbers from both sides. And then they also react, or they also hard stop against the ends of our intake gearbox. So, Jaden, we've uh, talked a lot of ramp up into this uh, spin dexter and turret that you're running here. Walk me through more uh, what you're doing for it. I have to admit, we were talking earlier, spin dexter is a term I don't hear too much this year as well, too. And, and not to mention pizza box as well, right, when it comes to robots. Talk yeah. more about that, and then we can see a note coming as well, too. That'd be great. Yeah, so the turret's probably one of the biggest parts of the robot. Or well, not the biggest, but one of the most used. So, we have 720 degrees as range of freedom. And if we can get down here, you can see the energy chain. So it kind of wraps around the motors itself. And then, um, it, so it can wrap around the motors and then it uncoils to kind of get that large range of freedom. And so the bottom plate of our turret is actually the plate for these spin extra wheels. And the spin extra is basically just this feeder system that feeds the note into the shooter. But basically these, uh, this turret plate at the bottom acts as the bottom plate for these rollers. And for these rollers, we have six rollers, three of which are each independently controlled by a motor. So they'll be spinning in opposite directions most of the time to get uh, the note fed into the robot. So we look down here, we have this ramp. So when these are spinning uh, in opposite directions, it'll kind of drag the note around this box, this feeder box, called the pizza box, based off some old prototype. But we basically drag it around this box, squished horizontally, and then it gets fed up this ramp into the shooter. Can we take a look, a look at a note coming into that? And from a compression standpoint here, like what is what does a note uh, d deformation look like actually when it's coming out on the robot? Like how do you compress it? Yeah, it's something we prototyped pretty early in the year and we found it worked pretty well and it didn't really do any, much like damage to it. Yeah, so we kind of saw that it squished horizontally kind of and then brought itself into the shooter and then expanded. That, that is absolutely just nuts, by the way, to see in person for the first time, like actually watching that go around like that. Definitely have not seen that amongst any other robots this year so far too. So when you were thinking about like, when we talk about like concepts and stuff like that, you said this is something you had very early on, but like what made you think like this was the way to go for 254 this year? Yeah, so we thought of the turret pretty early kind of for like shuttling reasons and overall just being able to clean up really fast. and. Uh, kind of, this was kind of based off our 2020 robot, which had that kind of washing machine design for those yellow balls. Yeah, totally. And so we kind of made this prototype pretty early on in the season. We found it worked pretty well. We stuck with it for our turret. And talk to me about uh, how your elevator is working. How are you approaching the trap as well, too? And let's kind of see a little bit of demo how that works. Yeah, so our elevator actually has a lot of functions and uses this year. So first of all, it's used for our amp, amp scoring and trap scoring. So for that, uh, we kind of store the note um, in this section right here. So uh, as Abby talked about earlier, we kind of have this bi-directional ramp that's kind of one way so that once the note gets in, uh, to, when we exhaust everything, it kind of gets shoved up and then it gets staged in here. Um, and then to score, we actually send the note between these two rollers, kind of like chopsticks, and then um, we reverse them to kind of score in that kind of angled way, which we found worked really well. Um, 
We also have a limelight for extra vision on the elevator. And yeah, um, one other thing the elevator is used for is human player loading. So we can actually bring it up and load from the human player station and uh, bring it down into the intake which then gets fed into the shooter. And one more thing about the trap is we actually have these climber wheels, which kind of react against the stage to kind of help push a uh, roll against the stage and get our robot up yeah. to score in the trap. But yeah, we can show that right now. Yeah. Uh, now we're gonna walk through what we do as a systems check for climbing and trapping. Uh, so first, since the climber arms are up right now, we're gonna put them down, so go to climb mode. Uh, so the first step of our systems check for climbing is that we roll these down. Uh, because after uh, they reach the bottom, that's when we re-zero the climbers. Okay, so the first step of our climber sequence is raising the arms, so that's going to go up. And then the next step is going to be one button click where all the action happens at the same time. So you're going to see the elevator raise and climber, uh, the note going into the stage position and uh, releasing. So do that. So this is all automated. Um, so all that sequence is automated. So we were able to uh, score the note into the trap uh, automatically uh, based on the banner, trip, uh, banner trips that we have here. Uh, which you want to talk about that a little bit more? Yeah. So we we take we use both of these banners. So we uh, we assume, we stage the note in here using this banner. So we send it all the way up and then uh, rotate the rollers a set amount to be to make sure the note is staged down here. And then once we press the climb up button. Um, the note goes through here, and then it goes out until this banner gets tripped, and then it goes back in a set amount. And then we found that instead of instead of supplying a set amount, a constant amount of power to the rollers to score the note, we pulse it. So we supply some power, and then we stop, and then we supply some power. And this helps uh, make it more consistent in that it'll like push the note in slowly, and then we'll almost always guarantee a trap score. Arjun, let's talk about some of the controls that go into this robot here, specifically from a teleop side. Walking yeah. through like some of your different states, how are you operating this robot, that sort of thing. Sure. So our, we decided to split our operator controls into modes this year for completing different parts of the game. So we have a mode called speaker mode, which is for scoring in the speaker, and that will track the goal using the limelights, which we'll talk about later. And then we have an amp score mode, which will spin the turret back and then stage the note in here and then it'll spin the note out through these two rollers out this way and then once the driver lets go of the shoot button it'll score it and then we also have a human player loading mode so we can uh we raise the elevator load in the human like the note and then it'll uh poop the note across the field um and then we also have a poop mode, which will just do the same thing, but without the human player mode. Can, you, can we show off maybe what one of those two modes look like? Maybe pick out a couple of your favorite ones? Yeah, sure. So this is the speaker mode. So it'll track the goal um, if there were an April tag. And then we, if we go to um, the amp scoring mode, as you can see, it stages the note in here. It, it was previous, we always stage our note in the shooter. And then it, we stage it in, the, in here for the amp scoring specifically. So if you, once we go to score the amp, yeah, so that's how it works to score in the amp. So it went up, it went through, and then uh, it'll come back out. And then uh, if you go to human player load, um, and then you, ra you intake, it raised, it raised the elevator, we took it in, and then it stages it in here. And then there's a poop set point. Um, which will, which is usually if you're all the way in the other opponent's wing line, it'll be uh, somewhere in the middle of the field. And then once you once you once you cross the the opposite alliance's wing line, it'll change its set point intelligently to like where the amp scoring is for our partner line, our partner robots to be able to score those notes. When you're uh, choosing how you divert the note like back into the amp, for example, when does your drive team typically make that decision for it? Is it something right away, like as you're moving, that note is diverting back into your amp score then? Or do you hold it and wait till you get closer to the amp for it to actually score? Um, I think usually as we get closer, we'll press the amp score and then it'll stage the, it'll stage the note in here. 
and then it'll be ready to score. Yeah, that's honestly just one of the coolest things to just watch over and over again. It's just how that keeps going back through, how that works is so cool overall. I love the process that your team has gone through Thank for you. that as well too. Ayush, we got to talk about some autonomous modes here. Yep. Uh, a couple things I want to ask you, of course, let's hear about more of a rundown of what you're doing for auto, but how did Cheesy Poos approach championships since you come in here? You know, we're seeing counter autos happen right now, a lot of different things for that. How did you approach uh, championships? And of course, give us a full rundown on what you're doing. Yeah, so we have a we have a lot of different autos this year. Uh, and the reason for this is because we know that there are going to be a lot of counter autos, as you mentioned. Uh, so what we have this year is what we like to call branching autos. Uh, so basically, when we go to the midline, if we don't hit a note that we want, then we'll switch over to the next note. And we'll keep switching notes until we get a note that we want. And then we'll come back and score that note. So we really have an infinite number of combinations because we can go to any note and we can score and come to the next note that we want. So uh, in auto, we have def different selectors. Uh, one of the selectors is the priority sequence to the midline. So we can choose which notes we want to go through in that order and also switch and continue in that order. Uh, af after that, we also have the location. So we have different locations which we start at. Um, and we also have sprint autos that go straight to the midline, especially for championships where that will be useful. Have you found yourself, uh, as we're filming this at the end of day one qualification rounds, like how many different selections have you been using? Have you found a need to do a sprint yet? Yeah, so we've actually been doing sprint most of our autos now, um, where we score a preload and go straight to the midline. Uh, before we used to do the three close, but we've been doing the sprint and then coming back to do the three close afterwards. For sure. And what are you actually like using to plan out your pathing? Like what kind of software are you doing? Some of the custom or what are you doing yeah. for that? So we use uh, the application called Corio, which sure. is similar to Path Planner, but we like it for its optimized directories. Um, but we actually split a lot of these Corio directories so that we can do what we, uh, how we branch autos. So we split the directories up so that we can do the branching and change the pass on the fly. Awesome. Well, 254 Cheesy Poos, thank you so much for telling us more about your robot. Another phenomenal, beautiful machine, by the way. And like I said, one of the coolest just note paths I've seen, period. Like, this is really fascinating to watch and see. So thanks for everything that Cheesy Poos does and help inspire the first committee. There's a lot of things teams can learn from that. We wish you best of luck here at the rest of the championships. Thanks a lot. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineer their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to Kettering.edu first to learn more and apply.